If you want this podcast free of ads, follow us now on patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by ACAST. How are you? It is podcast time and maybe you'll be delighted to hear that we are not going to focus on the war in Ukraine. We are going to take our thoughts somewhere else. And John, we're going to talk about the fact that today is International Women's Day. And we're going to talk about the position of women in economics. Good. Excellent. And this all came to me. I was reading something uh, about (laughs) casement again, right? Oh. I was reading something about casement casement, and... Uh, but not as so much on casement, on the boom in rubber in the 1890s. Yeah. And the boom in rubber, of course, provided the backdrop for casement's ventures into the Congo. But it also provided the backdrop of one of the biggest, the biggest booms in boom-bust cycles in commodities, of which we're in another one now with oil yes. and gas and everything, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It also, did you ever see the movie Fitzgeraldo? Don't think so. Fitzgerald was a movie from the 1980s. Sounds familiar. And it was about a guy called Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald. And it was with, I think, Werner Herzog or one of those, Klaus Kinski, right. one of those German bigwigs, right? But Fitzgerald was an Irish guy who, in the Amazon jungle in Manaus in Brazil, decided to bring an opera right. to the thing. And it's a huge, big biopic movie. Fantastic. But around the same, and of course, the reason he did this was Manaus was full of rubber trees. So rubber was the cash crop that generated the income for this guy's mad idea. Right. But what I was fascinated, I was reading about a riot that occurred in Cambridge University. And the riot, the cops broke up the riot, but the Cambridge University men were rioting against women being allowed into university. Uh, And the effigy, the effigy that they burnt at this riot was a woman in bloomers, which they didn't like at all, on a bicycle. And at the time, the bicycle was equated to the women's liberation movement, to suffragettes, because the bicycle was a mechanism of freedom for women. So there was a great connection between John Dunlop, the pneumatic tyre, Rubber and the suffragette movement. And this is the sort of thing I was reading the other day, the other night. But it then got me thinking about International Women's Day now. Yes. So that is 100 years ago, the suffragette movement, 120 years ago. And still women are not paid as well as men in every, almost every profession. And in economics, women lag behind men. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about women in economics to mark International Women's Day so we're going to go down to the Caribbean, talk to Marla Ducaran. So let's go Great. down to Barbados. Marla, how are you? i good, David. How are you? I'm flying. <laughs> now, this is something that you have spoken in private to me about lots yes. of times. Give me the update. What is the position of women in economics? Well, you know, as, a, as you and I have discussed, David, I think this is yet another instance where the global south is much different from the situation in the, in the global north, as, as you guys are called. My recollection of undergrad back in the 1990s was one where we had a pretty decent gender balance in economics. The social sciences in general were dominated by females. And then when you get to postgrad, maybe there was slightly less of a balance and more of a bias towards towards the men, but it wasn't that stark as it was, let's just say, in the engineering department or in natural sciences even. Um, I think we still had quite a bit of a dominance of females in social sciences back then. But what has happened now in academia, in the Caribbean, is that women outnumber men in almost all, including engineering, almost all fields of study. Um, wow. Which is, yeah, I know, it's fantastic. We actually have closed the gender gap in this region as it relates to education and as it relates to health. Um, we outlive men, we're healthier, and we're better educated, but we're still not paid as much. And we're still 
maybe 10% or 15% less represented in the labor force as well. So they labor, the female labor force participation rate is lower. But what I have noticed when, you know, we've discussed this and, and I kind of made an effort to dig into it in this region and what I think accounts for this perception of dominance of men in, in our field, maybe for sure in this region, but maybe even beyond, is that the men who we recognize as economists and we see them all the time and we know that, you know, these are economists in, in, in these countries and it's because they have a public persona generally, mm-hmm. right? It's very rare that you have female economists who have this public persona because most of the female economists are almost invisible because they're in the Ministry of Finance, they're in the Central Bank, they're in the Caribbean Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, they're in the World Bank, they're in the IMF. And so they don't have a voice and they don't have a public persona. The ones that are in academia, in the media, and the ones who are independent economists like you and I, you know, we're, we're a rare breed, right? Yeah. Um, we're the ones that have a public persona. And so it's just, it's not that they don't exist. It's just that we don't know they're there. They're almost invisible. Now, it's quite interesting you say that. I mean, you split it between the, the global south and the north. There is a Women in Economics Index, okay? And it's a website called Women in Economics. And I was looking at it. And what is quite interesting is that the bias against women is more pronounced in developed countries than in developing countries. So in Africa, for example, women are much more represented. There's still, we're talking 25% of the top economists, published authors, heads of economics departments, but there's mm-hmm. substantially more there than there are in Harvard and Yale and all these kind of very progressive American colleges. Why do you think that is? Um, I think that perhaps there is a, a bias when you're at school and, and heading into university as to which subjects you gravitate towards. And economics is one of those subjects that, you know, you have to be good in math and you have to have a really good grasp of mathematics. And you know that globally women are underrepresented in STEM. And so I think that might be part of the reason that mathematics is it's just not one of those areas that women, you know, gravitate towards naturally. So it's not, I, I think it's not a, an institutionalized thing or a systemic thing. I think that's just our nature. But I also feel like this is just my perception again from the global South. Again, when you look in the media at what an economist looks like, typically what an economist <laughs> looks like, it doesn't look like us, right? And so maybe women have this natural because of the perception of what an economist looks like, they feel like that's not me. I can't relate to that. And therefore they feel like they, they don't belong there and they exclude themselves. And if they're good in math, they end up in some other field, like maybe actuarial science, maybe engineering, more and more so, so in engineering. So I feel like maybe that you know role model, if you will, as to what an economist looks like, especially in the developed world, it's all white males. And all old white males, you know? No, no, abso- so abso- absolutely. I think that might be part of it. Can I also ask you about, like, economics is going through quite an amount of self-reflection at the moment. I know that doesn't appear the case to those outside the profession, but within the tribe, there's a lot of questioning. There's a lot of mm-hmm. doubt, thankfully, after having mm-hmm. had years of certitude. There's a lot of doubt. There's a lot of soul searching. And there's a lot of people saying, well, look, economics is not value-free. So the way in which particularly male economists said about lots of things, the developing world and the labor force and the welfare system is like, I'm giving you the maths. I'm giving you the figures. I'm giving the statistics. It is value-free what I'm saying. And that was kind of elevating economic advice to this almost pure scientific approach. And yet we all know that it comes laden with huge values. Yeah. Is it fair to say that if there were more females in the top economic positions everywhere in the game, the value system would be different? Well, I think certainly in academia, and again, in, in, in my experience, we had lots of female professors, but that's where it begins, right? Because they, they're the ones who plant the seeds. They're the ones who 
create the next generation of, of economists. So I think certainly if we had more women in academia, more women professors, ec economists, professors, that might help to shift. But also like everything else in life, David, balance. I think once you have that bias and, and, pre and dominance of men, the way that the decisions are made, the things that we emphasize will be different than when women are Give me, the, give me an example of that, because, because I mean, I always think the great example is somebody once said to me, I mean, it could have been you, actually. You said, do you think if Lehman Brothers was called Lehman Sisters, it would have gone bust? <laughs> I didn't say that, but it, it makes sense. The thing is, yeah, you know, when you look at, for example, the data that tells us that the more women you have in senior leadership positions, including the board of directors, the better your firm's financial performance. That alone tells you on a, on a micro scale that having gender balance is better for your economic and financial performance and outcomes. Why should it be any different in running a country? Why should it be any different in running a major global financial institution like the IMF or the World Bank and, and, and even the United Nations? The point is, it's not that we think that men are useless, right? Thanks. Um, in this Thanks. Field. That's decent of you. <laughs> I think that men bring a very important perspective, but so do women equally. And I think that when you have the two that balance, because men are more risk taking, men are you know better at negotiating boldly than women are. We know all of these things that we have our weaknesses and our strengths. And I think that if we had, for example, in the global financial crisis, when the policy response was basically to throw liquidity at the institutions that caused the problem in the first place, in the hope that it would trickle down, clearly that decision was made by men who did not understand that trickle down economics doesn't work. If it does at best with a significant lag and it's a blunt tool. And with this crisis, you know, the approach was different where it was not a trickle down approach. We sent liquidity straight into people's bank accounts and mailboxes and, and helicopter money. And what that did was it caused the economy to, to kickstart. Now, now we're overheating. But part of the reason for that, David, is because women reinvest 90 percent of their incomes back into their families and, wow. and men, you know, wow. you, you, 90%, we, we spend it on food, on education, on healthcare primarily. What proportion do you think applies to men in terms of how much of their, what proportion of their income they reinvest? I have in their no family? idea. 40%. What do y'all do so with what the do other do? What do we do with the other stuff? Exactly. What they, do you're, talking, <laughs> you're talking to a bloke who doesn't, who spends it all. Right. And so that policy approach worked partly because this is how spending takes place. Women spend almost all of their income back into their families. So again, I think that balance is important. Legislating the way California did, for example, legislating for more balance I think is important where it doesn't exist, but also educating. So for example, I'm part of the International Women's Forum, IWF. And one of the things we did was we did a study on, on women on boards and showed how much participation there is of women on boards in, in, in Barbados. And link that to the research that tells you the more you have gender balance, the better your financial and economic performance will be. And so once men understand this, and really accept it, then they can live it and deliberately hire more women in their senior management, decision-making, policy-making, board positions, for example. And that's when I think we're going to have real change, even in the field of economics. I think it starts there with gender balance in general. Now, let's look at, I mean, if you look at one of the things that, one of the ideas when I was young, uh, almost all doctors, let's say, in Ireland were men. And the doctor was a man and he was the pillar of the community, etc. Now, actually about 15 years ago, women became, there are more female doctors in Ireland now, and now it's becoming quite significant, right? Likewise, lawyers. It was always teachers. Like my mum was a teacher. She always said to me, the only job I could get as a woman was a teacher and that's what I could yeah. do. Okay. So lots and lots of intelligent women defaulted to teachers because that's what they could do. But what we do see now 
is that one of the most interesting, interesting global phenomena has been the empowerment of women, the quite rapid increase in educational achievement. Very soon, we will have a much more feminized society. How do you think that's going to change the way economics works, the way the society works? You know, even down to that idea of different ways of spending money. Yeah. You know what? There's going to be good and bad coming out of that, and we see it already. So like I mentioned to you in the Caribbean, we women are more educated than men and women have better health outcomes than men already, but we're still un underrepresented in the labor force and we are still paid less. What does that do? And and your your point about your mom is, is very valid because women still do two to three times more unpaid care work in the home compared to men, regardless of their education, regardless of their profession. So that those same female doctors that you mentioned in Ireland probably go home and fill the dishwasher if they have a family and do two to three, because this is a, a World Economic Forum global statistic. They probably still do two to three times more unpaid care work in the home than the men. And so that is that has to change. And this pandemic has affected women disproportionately, right? Because we're more represented in the front line, those doctors you mentioned. We're also more represented in teaching, as, as, you, as you would have alluded to with your mom. And we had to take on more of the responsibility of teaching kids at home at school. And I think that unless women are able to free up some of that time to devote to their careers, they will con continue to be underrepresented in the labor force and earn less because of that discount that's applied because of how much time women spend at home and on maternity leave and looking after children, taking children to school and so on. That has to change. That amount of time that women spend doing unpaid care work. Now you're asking what is going to happen and what are the effects? We're already seeing, for example, in all of the Caribbean, we have low birth rates. We have declining populations. I mean, just yesterday or the day before, I was reading a report in, on Bermuda, I mean, not in the Caribbean, but north of the Caribbean, where this is the second or third year in a row that their death rate exceeded their birth rate. And so what wow. you're going to have happen in a, from an economic standpoint, this has severe implications for pensions, as you know, for government finances, for healthcare. Because then you don't have enough working people, young working people to finance the elderly. So if you look at Japan, that's a perfect example of what the economic consequences are of a low birth rate. And the low birth rate comes from the fact that women don't feel empowered and, and capable and supported enough to have a family when they really will also want to be an economist or want to be a doctor or want to be an engineer. And so they just make a decision that I'm not, I'm just going to have one child. I'm going to have none. That is, I think that demographic shift, I think is the biggest price or the, the most expensive price, if you will, that we will pay for women being more educated and, and being represented better in the workforce and in professions. The second thing is, and we see this in the Caribbean for a long time and it's getting worse. I'm not sure about where you're from and in the global north, but men are becoming increasingly disillusioned and demotivated, useless, <laughs> you know, if you will, and violent. And this is something that, I mean, boys and men are being left behind and that's not what we want. I mean, we want balance. We do not want to over rotate to a situation where men feel disenfranchised and then don't participate in, in, in society as, as healthy citizens. And that's the culprit of, of, of what's and happening. Is violence women. against women in the Caribbean going up? It has gone up in the pandemic, definitely. There are studies, uh, Capri did a study in Jamaica that, that demonstrated that domestic violence did rise in many parts of the Caribbean. And it partly has to do with not just the effect on men, but the effect on families, children being at home, grandparents in some cases, and just too many bodies at home and frustration, fear, and all of that. But it's scary. I think that that sort of, that's an extreme situation. Maybe outside of the pandemic, it would not have been so bad, but it was a problem that we had before the pandemic where 
men are becoming increasingly marginalized, if you will, and disenfranchised, and that's not good. It's not healthy. So what goes through your mind in your own self uh, description? You always describe me. You says, you know, I'm a brown person, right? I'm a brown woman from a poor country. What goes through your mind? And, and we're talking, framing it in, in, in this issue of International Women's Day. When you hear, I don't know, the likes of Jordan Peterson or these sort of guys coming on and saying, well, the new victim in the world are white single men from northern countries. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Just give me a break. <laughs> As we say in Trinidad, a chance, please. Okay, a chance. Next. <laughs> a chance, please. No, no. Come on. No, but it's, yes, a, but it's, a, it's a thing, you know, the whole incel yeah, thing and all that. I, oh, it's, I understand, right? You, you don't but get it's the just that you've t- it's just that you've toppled from your pedestal and you're probably at the level of, of some of the others. I, I, and if that makes you feel like a victim, I'm sorry, but what about the rest of us who have, who, you know, whose feet or knees are still on our necks, right? As, as Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, could you just take your foot off my neck, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just for a little while? So, no, I don't buy that. Yes, it, the, the, the delta is that you've fallen from this to this, but there's still so many of us, you know, well below where you stand right now. So a chance, please. A chance. I like that. So that's the, that's the <laughs> Trini way of saying a chance, please. <laughs> Give me a break. Give me a yeah. break. Yeah, for fuck's sake. Okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but Marta, just let's go back to the economics for a wee bit before we go. If you look mm. at like the chief economist now of the IMF, is Mm -hmm. a woman. Christine Lagarde, boss of the ECB, is a woman. Janet Yellen, head of the Mm -hmm. American Treasury, is a woman. So there there does seem to be... Christina at the head of... At the, at the yeah, World yeah. Bank. and Stephanie Kelton. Stephanie Kelton. Yeah. Well, there's loads and loads. Marla Dukaram. Mm-hmm. But there are significant... There seems to be now, because I, I think, you know, you're right. What an economist looks like is a white middle-aged man in a suit telling yeah. people that's just not the way it is. And if you only could understand things, it could be explained. That's the general, the general approach, right? But now we're seeing women in very, very senior positions. And of course, the idea is that every movement needs heroes, needs people to look up to. Needs to, yeah. They blaze that trail I can follow. Do you think over the next 10 or 15 years that that will happen in economics? Because I, I hope it will. I'm not seeing it. I'm just seeing it at the very, very top. But do you think there will be a groundswell if economics becomes a little bit more feminine? And by that I mean moves away from the pure scientific neoclassical idea that we are all rational, scientific, unemotional, yada, yada people, and says, actually, we're human beings. Yeah. And and also the fact that, you know, C plus I plus G plus X minus M, if you increase G, it's going to mean increase in GDP. That doesn't work for countries like ours. You know, basic things in economics that we are taught doesn't apply to our economies. Yes, I agree. The more we have women at these in these positions, the more it inspires younger women to to take on this this field because now we have a role model or many role models and, you know, a vision of what this can represent as opposed to the middle aged white male with a with a pot belly and a suit. Um, they, you know, that was a perfect it, description. It, it, <laughs> absolutely. It's important that we've gotten here and the head of the World Trade Organization as well. Love her. Yes, it will inspire future generations of women economists. I think what we need to do as well is, yes, to get away from that thinking that that this is how things work and this is because we say so and it works in our very limited scope of a few countries and it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work for most of our countries. So a rethink and the the unorthodox economists, unorthodox economists, they're already doing that and revising. So we need a revisionist sort of approach. And I think it's, as you say, it's coming, it's happening. I look forward to the the next generation of, of economists who understand very well that what we were taught historically is not applicable to us anymore. And the the world changes, you know, things change. And as the world evolves, you know, so should economics. We have, we need a real reform agenda in in this field. And I think, for example, the whole Bretton Woods 
agreement and you know those major foundational um, institutions that shaped global economics and global policy and the way things work, those are where we need to start as well. And to, to bring that balance back into the way things are, you know, uh, the, the functioning of the whole system. And, and I look forward to it. No, no, I, I, I absolutely. You know, I, I look forward to it. And just before you go, because I know you've got to fly. I'm just looking at the war in Ukraine and I'm looking at Putin and I'm thinking to myself, if he were advised by a bunch of women, sisters, mothers, aunties, you know, do you think, and I mean this, mean this true, I mean, you can go back in history and there's Catherine the Great and she spilled lots of blood and whatever, but as a general rule, the maleness of where we are in Europe and the sort of male cul-de-sac we're in seems to me to be a reflection that femininity at the very top is absent. Well, of course it's still absent. I mean, just look at NATO, look at the the representatives at that vote, and you would see it. You know, it is, we are still absent. But so are poor and developing nations. We are still absent as well. And I think that we're the ones where women are better represented in general. The country with the best gender balance in this region is Cuba, right? And I think that when you have that, greater representation of small and developing and poor countries at the table, which are the countries generally where women are better represented, you have those two different perspectives coming in one. And I think that's what's needed. I think, you know, when they, when two elephants fight, who suffers? The grass, right? We need more grass <laughs> at the table, right? Where the grass? The women of the world are the grass, the developing nations are the grass. I think that you know, at that at those levels, our voices, women's voices, and developing countries, poor countries, we are underrepresented. And I, there has to be a meaningful, deliberate, conscious effort to change it. I think that the Secretary General of the United Nations, for example, has done a good job of surrounding himself with 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 really, really amazing women. But we still need. We, why don't we have a female secretary general? You know, we have an, a female secretary general of CARICOM here in the Caribbean. This is the Caribbean Association of Countries, basically, for the first time. And I have immense faith in her. We have, again, as I mentioned, the WTO. I feel like these women they have an opportunity to change the trajectory of the world's economy and society forever. I really hope that they all come together to consciously do this now, because if not now, when? Marla, we will leave it there. I'm going to see you in Dorky, so you can be yes. coming proselytizing in Dorky, <laughs> third weekend of June. I can't wait. And I look forward to it. Thank this, you. We'll see you soon, Marla. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. Thank you so much, David. Marla's always great, isn't she? Yeah. But it's interesting you were talking there, you mentioned your mum. Becoming a, a teacher, yeah. Becoming a teacher. And yeah. and my mom was the same. She was almost forced into nursing. And and what a lot of the women, certainly in the 50s, in Ireland anyway, they weren't allowed to do anything other than no, it was mad. nursing or the civil service was the other one. But you had to give up in the civil service if you got married. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, it's mad. So and imagine- my mom never wanted to be a nurse. She had other ambitions. But they were scuppered because of bloody because nuns, actually. Because she was a woman. I yeah. mean, it's it's mad because of other women, actually nuns. But I mean, the the world, thankfully, has changed profoundly. But it still is the case that in pivotal professions and positions of power, that there aren't enough women. For example, John, we know from all the studies about conflict resolution that having a woman in the room leads to better outcomes. Yeah. And I was watching the Ukrainians sitting down with the Russians the other day. Yes. And it was yeah. six men on one side, six men on the other, and a kind of a bloke chairman. And I was just thinking, you know, at these pivotal moments, women would just change the angle of attack, would maybe suggest other options, would maybe not stick their chest out and said, I'm not going to move here, yeah, yeah. and would maybe be a little more compromising. And the interesting thing about economics is I think that the reason economics has found itself in 
such a pathetic place, not being able to forecast things, not getting human behavior right, is that implicit in economics is what I would call extreme maleness. And extreme maleness has a weakness for science, for simple answers, for black and white, for straight lines. Mm. And it is amazing to me that over the last 40 years, in a profession that's dominated by men, that very few people have said, hold on, this basic assumption that we're all rational and scientific and cold, do you think that actually reflects us? But rather than look at the models as being maybe wrong, they looked at the models as being mathematically pure, and it was the purity of the mathematics that attracted them, not whether the models gave a good approximation to reality. Right. And right. the interesting thing about models is they're like simulations, right? Mm. They're like airline simulations, cockpit simulations. And the thing about the simulation, it has to at least be a good approximation of reality. If it runs counter to reality, yeah. which is what economic models do because they get the human behavior side wrong, well, then they're ridiculous. But if everyone's bought into this as a way of looking at the world, it takes a real rebel to say, hold on a second, that's not the way the world works. And it's only now that that's happening and where it's coming from are more women who are saying, hold on a second, that's not how it works. That's not how we work. That's not how we are. Yeah. So yeah. I think more women in economics, bring it on because it'll make the entire pursuit better, more grounded and much more useful for looking at society. Well, you know, the, the future is looking up. For instance, two of my daughters are now studying economics in unit. In, There's university. still time to change their mind, John. <laughs> Just a quick shout out to all our Patreons. Thank you so much for supporting us over the last year. I hope you're enjoying the course. I hope you're enjoying the questions. I hope you're enjoying the uh, chats on Patreon. And if you do fancy supporting us, all you got to do is go to patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. <laughs>